Thank you. The incredible, incredible Chuck Mendel Hall right here with me. Classic, classic. Thank you, Bob. Bless the mic. Sir Mendel Hall, how are you doing, sir? How are you doing here? What a wonderful crowd, man. What a wonderful crowd. All, all is good, my friend. I'm glad I finally got to join you on this. And uh, yeah, man, I hope I can uh, I can live up to PT standards. It, speaking of this man with his iconic hats all the way, he's got himself for the first time I've seen him with a non-Kangle hat. He's got on a Jumpman Jordan hat. Is, it, is this something for this special occasion or you just felt like this was just how you felt today for it? Just lazy. Uh, <laughs> no, man, I, I don't know. I didn't really pay attention. A lot of times if I know we're doing the Spotify, you know, look, I've got, you know, I've got some of those hats lying around here. So um, I could do either one, but I thought, you know, why not, man? I know you're a basketball guy. Let's do it that way. Oh, I mean, you're just coming out with the fire right here for NBA final status where we will get to that in a second all the way. How many hats do you own, Sir Mendes? <laughs> you know, you're not the first person to ask me this. Uh, I don't know. To be honest, man, of these little flat caps, I probably have about 20 or 25 of them, like the ones that... Uh, I guess I'm known for, but then I have like a ton of like ball caps and stuff like that too. So there's, there's I probably have like 50 or 60 hats, you know, something like that. That is an impressive array. And all of them, ladies and gentlemen, they are straight quality and fire without a shadow of a doubt. By the way, shout out to our great people, the great Sir Alex Weber, as well as the great Sir Ross Energize and the many others listening on here live and direct. Before we get into any, MMA stuff, we got to get into the origins of one <laughs> Chuck Mendenhall with this because this man having 917 as a whole number with New York ties, but in the nutmeg state, the great state of New Hampshire, but then loving Nikola Jokic the way that we do in unison for the Denver Nuggets. Can you say the origins of Chuck Mendenhall in terms of what town you grew up in and where would you say which state and town your loyalties fully locked. <laughs> well, it's all 303, my man. It's all 303. I'm from Denver, Colorado. I grew up in Denver, went to college in Denver. Um, I've moved around a ton since those days, but that's still all my loyalty. I cannot not love Denver sports teams. You know what I mean? Like once they, once you're, once you're rooting for those, uh, those teams, it's forever. So I, I'm stuck. So from the Joe Sackett, Patrick Wah days of the Colorado Avalanche. Oh yeah. Are you feeling for sure the title will return to the Rocky Mountains with the likes of Nathan McKinnon, Cole Mocker against the back-to-back -back reigning champion Lightning? It's going to be tough, my friend. I'm not going to lie. But this team was so close the last two years. So the Tampa Bay Lightning have won it the last couple of years. Why? Because the Avalanche did not make it. That's what I'm going to say right now. They, the Avalanche could have already won twice, two in a row themselves. They could have been the one that's the dynasty but unfortunately, they were very young. They got knocked out uh, in the second round of both of those finals. Very heartbreaking stuff. I think they've been dying to get this chance. And the way they've been playing, man, they have not lost on the road yet. They're 7-0. They're very young. They're very hungry. Uh, and they, they're 12-2 and two all, all told. I think that this will be our series. I think this is uh, – we're finally going to see them hoist that cup again, man. And it's been forever, I think 20 years since I've seen that. So we're ready. I got to give the Charles Barkley guarantee all the way. <laughs> I think it's going to go down for you with how well the Avalanche have played. And though the Lightning with their title credentials, it is something where they're just a little bit lesser than what they were last year. But it's just how great they yeah. have been. I, that guy, Nathan McKinnon, I mean, you would pay to Dude. watch him. But, it's greasy. Yeah. And, and my, slick. It's just a, a like that guy as a defenseman to do four like things. I know you're excited about this team for not only this season, but for many more years to come over the next decade, probably. 
Oh yeah, man. If they can keep the core of this team together, which I think they will. Kale McCarr and uh, McKinnon, I think, are the two drivers, you know, but they've got Landeskog. Uh, they've got him locked up. I, I think that they've got the core to do something. The goaltending will always be an issue until they, they get that figured out uh, on a bigger scale. But yeah, man, they, they, they've got the ingredients to be good for a long time. I mean, they have been just a ridiculous team to watch over the last couple of years. It's a little bit weird, man, because even last year, I felt like Colorado was so above and beyond the competition that they would cruise through the playoffs. It's almost like you're getting complacent without having won a title. You know what I mean? So it's like, it was kind of that stupid, uh, that stupid uh, psychology you take sometimes on this, but that's what makes them so good this year is they're, they're that hungry. They do not take it for granted. And uh, dude, those guys, they're just fun to watch. I don't know if you caught any of the Edmonton series, but. Oh yeah. Just yeah, shut him down, man. McDavid. Yeah. And McDavid had his moments, but he was he was kind of a non-factor for most of those games. It was just it was fun. Considering how that game one could have truly been like an NBA Western Conference Finals with all of that <laughs> epic scoring, um, how you guys were able to lock him and dry sidle down and Evander Kane and probably the only thing that yeah, can lock down Evander Kane besides some, you know, maybe off the off the ice issues and whatnot. But yeah. Was it was fun to watch him, uh, you know, sit out game four. It was a sweep, obviously. So, like, him out of game four was kind of uh, sweet justice, I think. Uh, you know what I mean? It was like this extra this extra something, this cherry on top. Yeah. What was for you, um, Chuck, the first sporting moment that made you say, I really do love sports, particularly hmm. in that Denver area with the success that has gone down with the franchises in that town? Oh man, well I'm old, brother. So it's like uh, I go way back to radio days, <laughs> like listening to radio, um, and you know, like t television, like early television. The, it was always when I was growing up. It was always Denver Broncos country out there. They had already played in the uh, the Super Bowl. Like as you got into the '80s, they they they'd already formed the Orange Crush and all that stuff. So I just remember my grandfather showed me a game. And somehow, like, you know what I mean? Like you're, you're a little kid and you're watching the uniforms and you're seeing all this, you start to know the names and then you tune in the next time, the next time, pretty soon you're hooked. And now like all these years go by and you're still watching them all, you know what I mean? And it was, it was kind of like that, that we didn't have professional baseball out there, but we had a minor league team called the Denver bears and later the Denver Zephyrs. And I went to a ton of those games. I, I played basketball. So I fell in love with that game. Um, so man, honestly, like the Denver nuggets, they became like, in, like I, I, you know, I was an Alex English, Tr Dunn. You know what I mean? Like these guys. You got that Alex English jersey? You got that rainbow jersey? Oh yeah! Oh dude, I've got it all, man. I, I, I was, I, I was uh, the king of the rainbow jerseys back in the day. I had like the pull away pants and all that shit, man. I was like, I was Denver Nuggets the whole way. I still am to this day. Yeah. And I told, I was talking to Ariel and Pizzi about this. Uh, I think on a podcast recently, but. That's the one team I want to see win more than all of them because they have never made the NBA Finals. As, they, as, as an NBA franchise, they've never made the finals. And that in itself kills me. But the fact that, you know, you watch these other teams get a ton of them and they, they just don't get the chance. I just want to see them get that one chance. I want to see them get the chance to win it. And I, I think I will tap into my eight-year-old self mm -hmm. and probably cry at that point because <laughs> it's been that long. It's like I've been watching them that long without, uh, without seeing them do that. I, I just, it's pent up in me, man. I'm dying to see it. And I'm hoping that next year is that year. That's the thing I was going to ask you, man, because you're getting Michael Porter back, getting Jamal Murray back, you're getting Nicole Jokic, who has to hear from, even though he was good people towards me, the good sir Nick Wright, <laughs> Nick Wright with all the slander about the great Nicole Jokic, Mike Malone, who I really just cherish. And Mike Malone, you need to have an interview with this man here all the way, too, because that would be yeah. something classic all the way. Do you feel, if you're healthy next season, that this could be the year for your Nuggets in 22-23. Well, man, I hope so, because I was one of those guys kind of living and dying on this premise that this year Jamal would come back toward the end of the season, right, maybe rescue the Nuggets and and uh, and put them through the playoffs. Now, a lot of people discount Jamal Murray because he had his best playoff performances in the bubble, which I don't know why that is, like why you would discount that. The dude was hanging 50 points on the jazz, especially in game sevens, elimination games, he was showing up. He is what Jokic needs in the playoffs. So like getting him back, getting him healthy will be huge. The Porter thing was supposed to be this big step up. 
year for him. And obviously that didn't work out with his back issues. He played only a handful of games. He was kind of garbage in those games. So I'm hoping uh, that he wasn't, he's the X factor because I feel like we gave him that max contract. And now you're like, I hope he earns that. And I hope he actually is a superstar in this league. If all that is the case, I do like our chances, man. I also, you know, you, you got Bones Highland, you still got Morris, you've got Aaron Gordon, who Bruce brought in to kind of be a fourth or fifth guy. And they're undefeated when they brought him over from Orlando before Jamal went down. So there's a lot of reason to be optimistic that they will make that run next year. But I think a lot depends on them getting like a good wing defender and, and strengthening themselves defensively uh, in general. And all the love that Luka Doncic gets, you know, around the league, it's always bad a little bit, little bit to me because that's who the Kola Jokic should be getting all of that oh, love man. in terms of universal praise, not trying to say, oh, only numbers lovers or stat geeks love Nikola Jokic. No, actual people who know basketball and yeah. watch basketball not for vanity really know Nikola Jokic is the real deal. Could you have foreseen him? be at this level. I mean, second round pick. And, <laughs> and same draft as Porzingis with number three on my Knicks. Only for him to be out doing Porzingis when he came to the garden when Porzingis was here. And now you see the trajectory where they're at. Do you feel Nikola Jokic has an even further step to go get, sir? It'll be interesting. You mentioned the, the second round. It's funny because I've seen that clip you know, obviously when they picked him, we knew no, I knew nothing about him, man. We, they, they were getting Nurkic too. And so they had like these two, uh, you know, European players. I, I would have assumed at the time that Nurkic was going to be the guy that they got, but they were playing like a Taco Bell commercial, man, as they, as they were did that. He wasn't even, it was such a non event when they picked him in the second round, they weren't even concerned with it, man. It's just one of those things, but I think he's the, the reason I love him. And the reason I think Denver loves him is that he doesn't really want to go, at least from all intents and purposes, from what he's said in the media, he doesn't want to play anywhere else than Denver. And I think that that's the first big step. So many pl players over the course of history have looked at Denver as kind of a, uh, uh, a purgatory or something that they were sentenced to, or, you know, maybe they would have a, a minute where they're like, yeah, this is cool. Like Carmelo, like he kind of gave the nuggets an identity for a while before he wanted out of there. I feel like Jokic wants to be there. And him wanting to be there has made other guys kind of want to be there. So there is a there's a healthier atmosphere to what's going on. I think there's a winning culture. What's going on, even though they just uh, lost Tim Connolly, their GM uh, to the to the Wolves. We'll see how that all plays out. But uh, I I just feel it, man. He's a winner. He's a winner, and he doesn't. I can tell he's a competitor. I I do think that he's going to see. Um, you know, he's going to see he's going to see that parade in Denver, man. And I'll be there for it. I'm telling you that right now. I will be there for it. That's a guarantee. You'll have the good search. Mendenhall guarantee. That's a, another Barkley guarantee all the way from Sir Mendenhall live here on overall over on the great Sir Chuck Mendenhall with me. By the way, shout out to Energize as well as Poppy Live, Sal and Killer Shaw. Look at all these guys. This is cool. That's just great support with it. And and Energize said, John Elway will be spitting out his craft beer in Ma High. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't know what they were referring to in terms of that moment there. But let me just ask you before we get into MMA. Do you All right. feel for your Broncos? Because the Rockies, this is not the Todd Helton, Dante Bichette days, or <laughs> no doubt about it. And, and, the, and the Carlos Gonzalez days, cargo days. But your Broncos. Having now Russell Wilson as your quarterback of this team, do you feel that this is an era for another title after Elway gave you two? After Peyton was carried by Von Miller in that second year after how great he was that first year? Do you feel that your Broncos oh, man. are going to make the playoffs this year? Sir? Oh, in playoffs, yes. I do think they'll make oh, the playoffs. Play I do think they'll make the playoffs, man. Um so here's the reason I say that it's not just because I'm a homer, although I am a major homer, but they they had a very good nucleus last year. Their their core group of guys, like they're, they're based on the last few drafts and all that stuff, were very good. Pat Patrick Sertan has ended up being a stud. Um, they've fortified their their line. I think that their receiving core has only kind of underperformed because their quarterback play has sucked so bad. Um, but like Jerry Judy will bust out, I think. Cortland Sutton was a pro bowler before he was hurt. I think he'll return to form. They've got Hamler was hurt last year. Yeah. I think that they're just 
they're kind of that that sleeping giant in terms of their core. So you add the quarterback, which has been the missing ingredient, and I do believe that will make a huge difference. If you really go back and look, man, there was like one possession type games that they lost over the last couple of years. They were very close games. They were they had uh, very poor coaching and all that stuff. We have to wait and see on how Hackett's going to be, right? Like we'll see how he goes. But playoffs, that's a guarantee. Now, can he win the championship? I don't know. Like that's one of those things because their own division is just so stacked. Yeah. That I'm not, it's, it's going to be tough, man. It's going to be tough, but and, and at least we could be optimistic now. And you were seven and six, you know, against the, the, the Bengals in that crucial game where, yeah. I mean, if, if Teddy doesn't get concussed, you know, we may not see the, the, um, the Bengals necessarily in the whole entire, um, you know, in the Super Bowl yeah. things, you know, you don't see, you, you may not see in terms of like having that be the situation that led to what happened in that whole entire game and how, um, how you know, the, the season went in different directions in terms of that 7-6 game. And then he got concussed and Drew Locke, oh, Lord. Let's not even <laughs> go there with that, considering I had to deal with so many Locke stands being all. Oh, my concussed. God. Oh, it, 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 it was brutal. It, it, Dude, it was brutal, let Seattle deal with them. That's going to be fun. The Broncos play at Seattle to open the season, and I just I just hope it's Drew Locke. I want them to get the full understanding of what it's like to have Drew Locke as their quarterback. That's what they got to figure out. Oh, I can't wait, good sir. I want to really, really see that indeed, and we can talk about that as the season comes forward. But what for you made you say, despite the love of all those sports, <laughs> what was the first MMA fight that made you say, I am hooked on this because of your love of wrestling too. But what was that that made you say, I really first love this mixed martial arts thing? Oh man. So I was, uh, not, uh, long story short, I was, I've been involved in media, all, alternative news weeklies where I was an editor and a writer for a long time before jumping into to all this stuff, man. But I, I used to watch it kind of peripherally. There was definitely some BJ Penn moments that I was, you know, there were, there were kind of like those things you would tune in, like Chuck Liddell, I would watch him, Tito Ortiz, those guys way back, mm -hmm. but nothing really clicked. Cause you know, I wasn't really writing about it. I think it was, I was, I was in uh, Fargo, North Dakota. This is a funny one, man. I was in Fargo, North Dakota, Dakota for a, a hockey thing I was doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went to the bar that night. It was like a blizzard type thing. And they were showing the rich Franklin Anderson Silva two. And uh, I just watched it and I, it was something about the crowd and just kind of sitting around talking to the people, the crowd there and everybody kind of getting behind it that I think I really, it really clicked for me. I actually took out a notebook and started taking a bunch of notes, which I wouldn't normally do, man. I was like, you're just sitting there writing little thoughts down and stuff. And I came up reading a lot about boxing, man. Like I, I read all the best writers about, you know, for that covered boxing. I thought that that was the best um literary chronology like you could find was like the boxing writers were so good so there was a seed already planted from the time i was young and i just i think it kind of clicked that night man that hey maybe i should try to write about this sport a little bit and uh it didn't it didn't happen right away but as when i went back to uh, southern california and i was working at a paper there it was right in the uh, area where dan henderson and rampage jackson and those guys were training and they were getting ready to fight and I did some profile pieces on them for the paper I was doing. And uh, the rest is history, man. After that point, it just kind of took off from there. But uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was kind of a gradual thing for me. I loved all the other sports. And I definitely had a curiosity and an interest in MMA. But it didn't really take hold until, you know, the UFC 60s or 70s, you know, in that range. And then this being the Fitzy University, you being at MMA fighting all the way then at that wonderful site and how that led to even more the path that you're on today with it over the course of at least those 15 years and you mentioning those features about rampage there what of all the great writing that you've done <laughs> has been the piece that you've been saying wow like i'm really really proud to look back on this piece right now wow that's a toughie man and i think i'm one of those guys who you know, I try to recognize, I think, if I've done a good piece, but at the same time, I'm one of those, like, I can't go back and read the shit I've already done. It's just, you know, you cringe, you could have done it better or whatever. You always want to do better. You try not to look backwards. I mean, the, the Jason Thacker one, because of the, uh, you know, the fanfare it kind of generated, and I, I felt like I heard about that piece for years. I still hear about that piece. 
I would say I look back on that one with a certain amount of uh, pride because it took forever to put it together. And it was like, a, I had to pitch it a bunch of times and dig, you know, find him, unearth that guy and go out to visit him in Vancouver area. It was just the whole process of that and then putting it together and uh, the piece came together very nicely. That one is probably at the tops. How long did that take? Uh, I was... The writing aspect of it was only a couple of weeks, but it was all the other stuff that, took, you know, it took years to develop. You know, it's it's kind of like one of those situations. Um, so I always look at that one. I mean, there was a couple of others. It's usually the long forms like that. I did a piece on the Judge uh, Douglas Crosby, which I'm, I was proud of. I don't feel like it really was read as much as the Thacker one, just maybe because it was Douglas Crosby. People didn't want to really delve into that dude's uh life but it was sort of fascinating because it was like looking it was like interviewing three guys you know he had like so many personality traits and like so many fronts he was putting up and then he gets sincere with you and philosophical it's just a weird guy to do that piece so that piece is up there the original dan henderson piece that i did which was a cover story for the alt weekly i was working on ie weekly that one always stands out um and i don't know man like i think i tried to establish a bar and as long as I felt like I was meeting that bar, my own expectation of each piece, the columns, whatever it was, I felt like I could I could be happy with them. You know what I mean? So there were very few I felt like I mailed them in or anything like that. So most of them I was pretty happy with. Who for you has been among the many characters in this sport? And, you know, there have been <laughs> a lot and, and are a lot of characters. Has been the one that has truly been such an insightful interview for you to have. Ooh, that's a good question, man. Um, insightful. Or I mean, were. there were guys like, to be honest, man, like the first guys who really kind of broke down that wall between what the UFC is, you know, what's really going on in the UFC, what's really going on with tough, what's really going on with those things were always valuable. I, I, I used to do cover stories for Fight Magazine, so I talked to these guys. I fly out to wherever they were and spend like a day or two with them, and this gave you a great uh, window into – a fighter's life to do this in their hometowns and whatnot. So guys like Gray Maynard mm -hmm. originally, uh, back Danzig. I remember talking to him having very heartfelt, like where he's telling you stuff. You're like, wow, I didn't know Rich Franklin was like that back in the day. Mm -hmm. Um, dude, there's a lot, there's a lot of them, man. I mean, a lot of the guys, if you get them even back then, you know, if you can kind of get them more one-on-one -on -one and, uh, treat it like a, a real thing where they they know there's genuine interest to know what's going on in the in that world they're very good man so i've been i've been very fortunate you know how it is in other sports it's very very difficult to crack that kind of like protective layer that they they keep for media and all that stuff um fighters weren't like that i've been very fortunate most of them were very accessible the ones who can keep that protective layer are usually like the guys who had already made it by the time you get to them, the Anderson Silva's and guys like that, who just, you know, they were, they were not going to give you anything just because they were so media savvy by that point, you yeah. know, they were protective. So. Yeah. That's something where in you little suit, cause we have a few more questions left because, you know, it's only about a certain amount of time with it, but we can make this happen at another part for part two down the line for sure. You mentioned with the, the Petita brothers, when they were in charge of at least the UFC, how that was like a family atmosphere mm -hmm. with that before Endeavor took over and Lord knows that Endeavor and all um, messed with that all the way. Now, has there been any time lately that you talked to any, either, uh, either the Petitas, um, especially we talked to Tillman in regards to his Rockets, obviously, but <laughs> you know, had, you had any talk with them and how, you know, much, you know, they've been missed in terms of um, just in regards to how things are run with the main MMA promotion, like in the world. No, not really, man. Um, geez, the last time I talked to, La I've only really talked to Lorenzo. I've never talked to Frank. I've seen him around once or twice, but he's kind of like the, the Sphinx character in the game. Like, I don't think he hands out too many interviews, but I talked to Lorenzo a few times, man, but it's been now a few years. He used to, oh, he was a, he was a fan of the MMA beat, which we used to do. So he would, uh, he would talk to me about that because, there are certain things he would like. He, he just wanted to tell you, hey, you know, you guys were pretty good about this. But then he's like, you guys don't know shit about this. You know, he would always want to tell you the stuff that you didn't know, uh, which I appreciated. I thought it was really cool that the guy who owns the, the UFC took the time to actually watch the show and to give you feedback on it. I thought that that was like uh, very cool. But you, you nailed it. It was a familiar thing. 
I think that there was a point in time in MMA when everybody felt they were in on it together to grow it as big as they could to kind of grow out of the, uh, you know, the shadows of other sports and make it truly into something that was their own. And I think that Fertitta's really led that charge because they felt made it feel inclusive. And I think Dana White uh, back then wanted to make it inclusive based on that relationship. I think he, you know, he wanted to give the media as much access as he could um you know what i mean all that stuff and i think that the media itself and fans they all felt part of this small thing that was blossoming and they all felt like they were leaving their own um you know whatever you want to say their mark on the sport as it grew and I, that was the best period for that reason obviously it's gotten to the point where espn and there's uh sponsorship deals and there's all this stuff like they've made it they've cashed in Dana White has made it. He's cashed in. Lorenzo has made it. They've all cashed in bigger than they probably ever could have imagined. And it's just a different space now, man. You know what I mean? It's a different space, but some of that still exists. And I think that our green room is kind of an example of that because or not our green room, but our Spotify live room is, uh, is an example of that. There are still the, there's this core group of people that can come together and still kind of feel like they're in on something together. And that, that matters, man. And it's fun. It kind of, I kind of get, um, it kind of feels like a familiar because of those old days. I think having those conversations we do with, uh, with Ariel and, and PT and then all of you guys, man, it's just, it's been a lot of fun. Shout out by the way. to one of those members, Sal, who said the Renzo runs Vegas. And I mean, that's <laughs> really be the case in terms of the Renzo and Frank uh, Petita on that whole note with that, as we, as you mentioned with the community and how we are fully supportive of you three with that in regards to especially those issues over access and everything. One of the final questions that I have for you is that after after everything that Ariel's had to deal with with Dana and still and everything to deal with, how's your relationship, if <laughs> you, you know, with Dana White in terms of if he gives you issues for just doing your job as a quality journalist? To be honest, man, I've not really been so involved in the game since I uh, was working at The Athletic and that whole thing happened. So it's been like, what, six, uh, 18 months, something like that, since I've been really in a situation where I have to deal with the UFC. Um, but as far as I know, man, there's really no issue. They've never really given me any any flack. I kind of mentioned that Dana pulled me aside at Foxwoods at one time. That's just a funny story that happened. Uh, but ultimately, man, like – I haven't really had any negative stuff. I've written plenty of negative stuff. You do hear, you do hear from them a little bit, but not in any way that you'd think that they didn't know you, what your job is. You know what I mean? Like they understood my, my function for MMA fighting for the athletic, all that stuff. So I would say I'm in good standing, but dude, I don't know because I haven't really applied for credentials in a little while. And uh, who knows, they may hate me by now. <laughs> it's, it's very possible. Yeah. But how they are, it they, especially him, he can really have that type of um, bipolar yeah. perspective here and there. Um, by the way, shout out to um, TSC, Troy Falkus, as Energize is saying, wow, TSC getting left out again. We're making sure we didn't leave him out. Chuck, we only have <laughs> a few more minutes with that, and certainly we'll continue this another time with it. But for you right now, who for you is first? Your top five wrestlers of all time, because I know you love wrestling with that. So do you have a top five? Of you talking about pro wrestling? Oh, oh yeah, pro wrestling. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, not, not, <laughs> not any grapplers with that, but the top wrestlers of WWE, WCW, ECW. Oh my God! Maybe for you, man. Well, dude, I'm like, <sighs> I was always kind of one of those guys who like the fringe dudes, like Leaping Lanny Poffo and Coco Beware. You know, these dudes who were like, they were like, they were kind of like, uh secondary like uh figures they weren't really that good but i always kind of dug those i don't know andre the giant would always stand out i felt like he was an event man these these are the ones from way back but uh these guys man iron Sheik. i was just uh i did a little piece on him recently and i was like Get out you of know what a, what a, i mean you gotta have that guy sometimes you gotta have a guy who blurs the lines and just i mean those types of guys showed actual boxers and MMA fighters and stuff, how to kind of heal the right way and how to do these things, man. You know what I mean? So I, I don't know, man, like those are the old school. I, my son pays attention to the new guys a lot. Um, I don't know, man. I mean, I kind of, I, I enjoy just watching it in general. I don't know if I really have favorites anymore. Yeah. yeah. But, oh, uh, I, I, I've stopped watching after really, 
I say after the rock left and when John Cena was emerging, yeah, I just got too busy for me, you know, with that. But um, you're right about Iron Sheik being so underrated with that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a big macho man, Randy Savage guy. That was good. You know, it, it just was seeing him and being timeless. And, yeah, I miss the jobbers, man. I miss the jobbers who would just show up. Remember, like they, would, I, I, you're, you're probably too young to remember, like when they would have these jobbers, like. Just show up and it was just a showcase for whoever, you know, Jake the Snake Roberts or whoever was on there. It would just be a showcase for them to like just blast somebody, you know? Yeah. Um, I miss those days. And who for you is your top five MMA of all time? And if that's in any selective order or oh, not, I, I know for sure it would be like GSP's got to be <laughs> you know, and all that. Who for you is in, in your top five? So if we're talking about just favorite guys, like guys that I like to watch, Jim, Jim Miller, okay. love him. Matt Brown. Um, Dan Henderson was always the guy, but I think it's because I kind of got my start with him. So I, I used to get nervous before he'd fight, man. It was like one of those things you're like, I don't, don't want him to lose, you know, uh, which he did plenty of. <laughs> so I was disappointed a lot. But uh, who else? I don't know, man. I mean, would Tito and Shep make the list? Of, you know, would they would they make it? Nah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, there was a moment where I really liked Liddell. I went to, I did a piece with him in his house uh, in San Luis Obispo, and uh, he had a stripper pole, and he had this like closet full of like uh, memorabilia that was like ridiculous, like Brett Favre signed. Oh yeah, here's a Brett Favre signed jersey he gave me, just thrown in there. I was like, dude, this is insane. That guy was on top of the world at one point. Um, yeah. yeah, man. I, I mean. That's a tough question. It's almost like I needed to narrow down. If you're saying one of my top, uh, my top fighters, I would say those type of guys because I like watching them. You know what I mean? Like uh, I used to love Martin Martin Campman. I thought he was like such a slick striker and all that stuff, man. I used to love the earlier John Jones. Like you'd watch like his fights. I was fascinated by his movement and what he was doing out there, man. Like, uh, and then Anderson Silva. I mean, the, the guys were like that. But then if you're talking about the greatest of all time, that it becomes a whole different discussion. But, yeah, man, I, I'm so all over the place with that that kind of question. Do, do you have a GOAT as one final question or or no? Do you, it's just two different areas. And... No, I mean, if I was to pick one, I'd probably go with GSP. I'd probably go with GSP, but I feel like it's a, it's like a fluctuating thing for me, man. It's like, you know, like some of the, the guys kind of emerge. You don't think it would be like that, but uh, it kind of gets like that. If you think about it from different perspectives, I, I think that my, my guy that I land on the most is GSP. Well, I think that is a solid choice that few could refute on that. By the way, PC Carroll said for his favorite rest of all time, ultimate warrior. He said he's actually my dad. Um, the great sir from Dublin over there saying that with his incredible my man. Shout out to the great sir, great lady Amy Flex and the many others. The great and tremendous Shut Minor. Everybody give this man round of applause. Well, we are done for this installment of overall overtime. But we got to play Gordon Lightfoot Sundown. Yes, I actually am. Remember, Sundown for sure. I can make sure. I have to make sure. That was almost a miss on me. We'll be back for another edition of Overall Overtime. We'll let you know who it is. But until now, you'll hear this on playback on Believe Network on YouTube in a minute. The Great Search Shut Minute Hall. Sam Jones. We are out. Shout out to you, Romero. I'll see you,